My name is Michał Ślaski. I'll, I'll give you a quick background um, to what's my background, but also how the Erlang VM timeline looks like. So Erlang is quite an old piece of technology. It was, uh, it's, it started out in 1987. I was six years old at the time. I didn't know a thing about reactive programming, Erlang programming. I didn't have a clue about quite a lot of stuff. <laughs> I think I will ask the same question. The question was, why not? I was asked the same question to my mother as soon as I'm back home. <laughs> <laughs> now, Erlang has been released as open source some years later. And this is why we all can enjoy the, this piece of technology nowadays. I was about to start my computer science degree here at the uh, university of uh, AJH University. And by the time I graduated, Erlang VM got the SMP support. So it went multi-core. Now, despite that I have like 10 or, or more years of Erlang development behind me, the lessons from Erlang, Erlang VM, that I want to share with you today, I believe apply to many different technologies. So if you're not sold on Erlang, don't worry. I'm not gonna pitch Erlang to you. I want to share with you some lessons learned from the Erlang systems that we have been building over the years, which I believe can be important for any big system, no matter in what technology you're going to build it. Because what I think is that conferences like this one quite often focus on well, how to improve our development, testing, how shall we use static types, dynamic types, what are the benefits? And we keep on discussing different things. Uh, we, we argue that certain languages are better than others. And this is all good. This is about improving our efficiency of programming. This is good. But we need to look at it in some context. Time context. How much time that a system, an IT system, leaves is spent on the development of the system versus maintenance of the system? There are systems that have been running for 20 years, even though they've been devel in development for a few years. So if you think about the whole design process, then development process, and then maintenance process, now you get a big picture of what is it that we are trying to do. We are building software which will run for a year, for five years, for 20 years. So Erlang VM, of course, is about the development phase. How do you design and test and program? But equally, if not more, important part of the Erlang VM and the Erlang ecosystem is about maintenance phase. How do you maintain the system and don't, don't go insane? Okay? So I will now try to share some ideas why certain properties might be of interest. So those happen to be the properties of the Erlang VM, because those are lessons from Erlang. But I'm quite sure that a lot of those properties are shared across different technologies. So I will try to well, share my thinking about why certain processes are needed. And hopefully, you can get something out from it. There will be some takeaway from this presentation, which applies to, to your technology, to what you are doing. So behaviors, um, design patterns, of course, this is well-known subject. There's, there's nothing new here. Client server, finite state machine. Erlang has also application and release design pattern as part of its so-called OTP. What it means, what is it for? It means that we have consistent maintenance procedures. You build one artifact, and you will deploy it always the same way. No matter who built the system, when was the system built, where it is supposed to be deployed, 
one way of releasing Erlang software, something that Docker is trying to help with, boxing the system, making sure that this actually is easy to, well, ship. So in Erlang terms, we have the Erlang OTP release, which you can put into a tarball. You can see here um, listing from one of my Erlang tutorials, workshops, that you can uh, find on my GitHub. At the end of this workshop, you get to the point where we build a release, which um, is packed into a tarball. And then this tarball is a self-contained Erlang system. So how do we deploy Erlang? We copy tarball, we unpack, and we run bin something. That's it. It is self-contained. It has the Erlang runtime system inside, all the libraries, applications, and everything. So this design pattern, which is not built on top of Erlang OTP, it is part of Erlang OTP. It is, it is there because there is a very good reason to have it. This makes, ensures that every team member will ship software the same way. If you have a big organization, tens of people working on different small things, the deployment procedures will be consistent. This is good for maintenance. Because systems will be, uh, well, maintained by many people over the years. Okay. Another property here, robustness. Robustness with uh, um, supervision concept that probably some of you have heard already. There, was some, there were some presentations about Erlang supervision trees already. Um, the idea of focusing on the correct case rather than trying to mitigate all the risks and um, have the de defensive programming style. So we, we accept that things will crash. No matter how good programmer you are, and I bet you are the best programmers in the world, you will have some bugs that will sneak into the system, not because you have designed them in the wrong way, because users will misuse your systems. Because systems are always built correctly. Those are the users who misuse our systems. So let it crash. It's not about, oh, I have this bug. It's about the user has used your system in a way you would never think that it can be used. Now, so what for? Exactly for this reason. We need to be resilient to misuse of our systems. So Erlang has the concept of a supervision tree. Hopefully some of you are already familiar with it. Uh, we have one processes observing other processes in the system. Uh, one, the, the observing one is uh, ob supervisor. The one doing the job, which is being observed, uh, is a worker. You can have like trees of those. So have many workers and supervisors and, and so on. This really helps. Encapsulate issues, problems, catch them, deal with them locally, and move on. Another interesting property. It's 2015. How many systems that you have to design are not distributed systems? I don't know, but probably quite a few of you have to build already distributed systems. It's the internet, it's the internet of things. Systems are distributed. Now, Erlang has, is aware of, of network, of the distribution layer. So distributed Erlang is how we call it. It's something that powers the internode communication. What for? It's not only for building distributed system, but it's also quite useful for accessing your node remotely. So you have a cloud and you have a React cluster, 20 nodes. How do you maintain this cluster? You want to have some observing tools, of course, gather some metrics, but sometimes you may want to connect to those nodes and observe something inside, inspect a node. So Erlang distribution provides you a feature which if you have two Erlang nodes, as in 
Erlang virtual machine instances, and they are connected together, they see each other, right? So you have nodes, cut and flee. And if you have two islands of nodes, like here, the other island consisting of dog and bird, the moment you actually connect one of the left-hand side with one of the right-hand side nodes, like in here, you will immediately get the full mesh. The Erlang distributed layer is aware of other nodes. It will gossip about other nodes, and you will get a fully connected mesh, and you can start sending messages from cat to bird and from flea to dog. Now your network consists of all the nodes. Being able to connect to a remote node and to execute some code on it helps not only with like, spawning a shell and doing something. It actually helps build some interesting, interesting tools which help us maintain Erlang systems. I believe some of you are familiar with the Unix top tool which looks something like this, right? You have the OS level processes. They, um, you, the top tool reports CPU, memory consumption, other things. Similar tools can be quite easily built for Erlang. You're connecting to a remote node through Erlang distribution layer, and you draw a similar well, picture with Erlang processes in it. And you also report heap size, reductions since last call, other things. So think about someone who is not really an Erlang programmer on a daily basis, but he has to maintain an Erlang system. What is a typical way of inspecting some misbehaving, well, Linux system running in your cloud? Well, you connect to it. Typically, the first thing you do is you type top to see what's going on. Which process in the OS is consuming RAM or consuming CPU? And the same here. One of the Erlang nodes is misbehaving, maybe, something. You want to see what is causing it. You connect to the node, and you see there is a guy who is quite busy, or he has allocated a huge heap. It's not necessarily recommended to run this in a system who, which has millions of Erlang processes, it's a different story. But still, I'm just trying to share some thoughts here that the ability to observe, to inspect your system is extremely important because once it goes live, you need to have tools, means to find out what is going on inside. And Borrowing concepts, ideas, tools from the Unix or your Linux environment is a good idea. People are maintaining Linux boxes for ages. I would like to, frankly, uh, have a similar set of tools for Erlang VMs, which would allow me to do pretty much the same inspection as I can uh, with some Linux tools. All right, some more properties. Hot code loading, which, uh, well, as if you read about hot code loading, people say that this enables nonstop operations, and it's, it's true. At the same time, it's quite complex to leverage hot code loading feature on a live system, because it requires you to be very, very careful about um, what is it that you upgraded, whether your, I don't know, Minija schema has changed or not. So hot code loading for live systems, well, yes, but use it with caution. What I would say, it's, it's the shorter development cycle which you can immediately benefit from. So what is your typical development cycle? So, so you have a user story you need to implement, so you have this story, you start to develop some tests, and then they, in, well, uh, help you structure your 
implementation, and then you want to test it at some point. So compile and test it. And imagine that setting up your system in order to test a module takes 10 seconds, or maybe half a minute, because it has to start some um, databases, load something into memory. It takes time to test a function, which has been just recompiled. With hot code loading, after compiling the module and loading it into target system, system under test, there's no need to reload the whole system. It's enough to reload just the module. And you immediately get feedback. Is it what I just compiled working? Does it do what it has to do? This does shorter the development cycle, meaning it takes less time to do the iterations of develop, test, develop, compile, test. It does help. And non-stop operations is there, yes. However, it's quite a tricky business. And then tracing. Erlang VM has tracing built into the Erlang VM, into the machine. So of course, there are dtrace, uh, system tab, uh, or other tools available for Linux, Linux kernel, user space that you can use. And you can do very interesting tracing. But here, this does work even on Windows. This does work even on Raspberry Pi. The tracing is built into the VM. This is quite important because it, again, helps you understand what is going on. It helps you quickly, quicker, I believe, narrow down well, the issue, the problem, the, the, the flow of data for your system. And again, it's running within the Erlang VM. So all platforms that the Erlang VM supports get dynamic tracing in it. It helps for live debugging. If you're already maintaining a system in production, it helps you understand, uh, well, which function calls are being really called, with what data, what arguments, what do they return. Uh, and there's no need to instrument the code up front. So how many times did you have to put this one more printout in your source code just to better understand which branch of your code the system is actually executing. How many times? I, be I believe many times. So Erlang VM means no dupa debugging. This is the term for, you know, da da da. Dupa one, dupa two, dupa three. Once the method is used extensively, sometimes it even reaches the production code. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. How it works, really. I borrowed this um, slide from Mats. Thank you, Mats. You can enable, disable tracing of, on a live system. And it really doesn't cost you much to have this tracing on or off as long as it does not trigger. In other words, when we turn on tracing, as on the right-hand side, we just have this extra jump instead of instruction, which let us go through some tracing pattern. So we do some pattern matching. And if this triggers a tracing event, then we generate the tracing event. If it doesn't, we just continue with the other instruction. So th this is not, OK, it does have some overhead, of course. But it's, it's not a disaster. And then you can have quite a few interesting tools built on top of the Erlang tracer. For example, Erlang performance tools, the IPER repository, uh, where you, it's called Redbug, one of those tools that is part of IPER, where you provide uh, this, this pattern, this intention, what is it that you want to trace? You want to trace function calls to the module lists, function seek, with some two arguments, and then return what 
is it that the function returned at the end? And then when the function is actually called, this is line number two in my listing, you not only get the result of calling the function, well, that's normal, but you also get to see this extra printouts, as you can see below, which is the process ID executing the code, followed by the tracing event. So what is it that has been called? Okay. Another interesting tool built on top of Erlang Tracer, eFlame, which is um, a flavor of, of another tool called Flame with Flame Graphs. Maybe some of you are familiar with Flame Graphs. They, they do probing of stack traces to understand which um, functions the system is being well, calls frequently. As eFlame is based on Erlang tracing, we don't need to probe stack traces. And this gives us some extra interesting feature, which is the ability to notice blocking calls, which in eFlame are drawn in blue. That's all I had for the time being, as far as the Erlang VM lessons is concerned. The main takeaway from, from today is pick the technology which is right for your job, for what you're doing, which has the support for uh, technologies, libraries that you need, but also keep in mind that the system that you're going to work on for the next months, or maybe a year, year and a half, is going to be maintained. And does your technology, does your technology stack has all it takes to maintain the system for 10 years? And in my presentation, I try to highlight what is it that may be needed once you went live. So hopefully there is some... Um, some takeaway, even if you're not an Erlang programmer. If you are interested in Erlang, maybe because this is the first time you have heard of it, I have a few slides more. What you can do next? First, you should watch Erlang the movie. It's a masterpiece of Ericsson department of uh, movie making. <laughs> um, with some great celebrities like Joe Armstrong. If after watching the movie you are still not convinced, I recommend Erlang the movie <laughs> sequel. This one is for modern audience. <laughs> you can find both movies on YouTube. Then you may want to explore some open source projects that have been developed in Erlang. RabbitMQ, for example. We had a pleasure to listen to some um, RabbitMQ architect only a few hours ago. Mangus.im, interesting XMPP server implementation. Ryak database, CouchDB database. Those are open source projects, large scale systems have been built on top of those technologies. You may want to, um, <clears throat> well, read about it and try to ask questions why, sorry, <coughs> why Erlang has been used in those projects. There's also Erlang community. If anyone would like to join, you can find us on Erlang Central. You can find us in Stockholm in a few months' time. There is also mm, Lambda Academy, where we teach Erlang. You want to join us and help us build Małopolski Internet Rzeczy? Join us. And we will be asking difficult questions, some interesting problems to solve. This is actually not part of Erlang solutions as in our day-to-day -day business. It's more the effort of the community here to learn the functional paradigm. So Lambda Academy is about helping people learn the functional paradigm 
through interesting, challenging problems. And um, the Internet of Things seems like a challenging problem. That's all I had. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, if we have time. Yeah. We do have time. Excellent. Any questions? The question is about the Lambda Academy classes. Um, the, the website will be refreshed and it will provide some more uh, details soon. <laughs> it's about meeting once per month physically in Krakow so that we can see each other face to face, talk about things, we can give lectures, we can teach people about some concepts live, but then throughout the rest of the month we are developing through GitHub an open source project or projects together. We collaborate through GitHub issues, we collaborate through other well, technologies, but this is done mostly remotely, and we meet once per month at the Lambda Academy. Okay? Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much.